the second day of uh, our Global Social Protection Week. My name is Nozi Pombanjwa, and it is an absolute pleasure to come back today as your moderator for today's conversation. Madam, thank you very much. If I can ask you, ladies and gentlemen, to please take your seats, including the gentleman to my right. If you could take your seats, please. Thank you. If I may ask the ladies and the gentlemen at the back to take their seats, I'd be highly appreciative. I appreciate that. I thank you for your cooperation. Right, so yesterday we spent the day in a series of very, very robust and insightful conversations. We had many insights coming out of these conversations related to social protection systems as an investment that has the ability and that has evidence of high returns. We had a conversation about how we might also collaborate our efforts better and coordinate in order to meet uh, our aspiration of universal social protection by 2030. This morning, we kick off our conversation with the realization that if we're going to achieve Sustainable Development Goal 1.3, we're going to have to step up and accelerate the investments, both public as well as private. Ladies and gentlemen, today, we are also going to be having a conversation that looks at how might we begin to create the fiscal space in order to ensure that at a national level, we are able to unlock the necessary funds, but also in the context of provided support at the international level. Before we get to our conversations, I'd like to make a few reminders with you. The first is just to remind you of the translation services that we've got at your disposal this morning. The channels are as follows, English for one, French for two, uh, Spanish is channel three, Russian is channel four, and Chinese translation today is on channel seven. I'll repeat that, English channel one, French channel two, Spanish channel three, Russian channel four, and Chinese channel seven. I'd like to also remind you of the hashtags that we are using today in order to amplify this conversation on social media. Um, we are going to be using the hashtags the same as yesterday, hashtag SDG 1.3, hashtag USP2030, and hashtag ILO100. Again, ladies and gentlemen, we have um, digital maps that are out on display and exhibitions on the floor just beneath us at R2. Please, during your coffee break, use this time to go and uh, explore and familiarize yourself with uh, the cases and the case studies that are presented by these digital maps. Um, these have been set up for your enjoyment. And lastly, but certainly uh, not least, remember that the lunchtime break is, uh, is, is created and designed to be two hours long so that you can have this time to connect, to network, um, and to have any bilateral engagements that you so wish. So let's please use the time during lunch to do that. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, we move now into our first panel discussion for the morning. Achieving sustainable development goals requires increased investments. That is the topic and the theme. The context is important, and the context is this. We know that growth alone is not going to be enough to bring prosperity to all. And in fact, if we look at the numbers, the numbers show us that the share of global income that's been accrued by the top 1% has doubled between 1980 and 2016 to almost a quarter of global income. And this at a time where the bottom 50% has only received 10% of global income. We also know that if we look at the public and private wealth, that we are seeing that countries are becoming richer, but governments have become poorer. And that's an interesting insight. We also know that if we begin to look at the UN uh, Secretary General's roadmap for financing 2030 agenda, we see that this roadmap is calling for much bolder action, especially when it comes to public and private investment. Most importantly, 
for this conversation. We know that there have been a number of figures and stats that have been shared um, that indicate that there is a finance gap that needs to be bridged. And so in this particular conversation, uh, we're going to be talking about and sharing the report that, or the study that the Director General spoke about yesterday, an ILO landmark report that's really going to be bringing more clarity in terms of the actual numbers behind the additional investment that is being required. So this conversation is going to be slightly different. Our chair of the conversation is going to present the findings of this study, um, uh, speaking to the financing gap. This will be followed by a keynote address uh, on financing of social protection. Um, and so we're going to uh, go into that. And finally, we're then going to go into a panel discussion where we're going to be bringing the voices of government, of civil society, and academia to contextualize the results from their point of view. And so for now, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Musa Amaru, who is, of course, the ILO Deputy uh, Director General responsible for field operations and partnerships to present the study for us. Let's give him a round of applause, please. Excellence, Mesdames et Messieurs les Ministres. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, ministers, representatives of uh, employers and workers' organizations, dear experts, government experts, and ladies and gentlemen, representatives of civil society, of the university world, and dear colleagues uh, of the United Nations, good morning. Today, the entitlement to social security uh, with this official uh, life, sta uh, life standard is not there for more than 4 million, 4 billion people. The 2030 agenda wants us to set up the promises, the universal promise, the universal declaration of rights, which was uh, put together by leaders more than 70 years ago. We know today that social protection itself, it does keep its promises. It is an investment in, in the prosperity found once again in social peace and prosperity and in the future of our children. In the September last year, during the General Assembly of the United Nations, the Secretary General Antonio Guterres affirmed that the achievement of the, the SDGs, uh, the 2030 horizon, required investment of about $5 million to $7 billion per year. Five, five million to seven billion dollars per annum. According to him, and I'm quoting him, we have made some progress in terms of mobilizing resources, but we have to do more, much more, end of the quote. So out of these five million to seven billion dollars per annum, what is the share of necessary financing for social protection? We didn't know it up until today. But the new study of the ILO on the requirements and financing to be able to reach uh, the SDGs and, the, and uh, SDG 1.3 and social protection specifically, which I have the honor to initiate today, enables us uh, to answer this question. The 1.3. SDG can be reached by establishing in countries what the United Nations calls the social protection floors. They uh, provide these, uh, these that is, S this SPS, the security and life from birth to death. These are family allowances, there's maternity leave, uh, pensions for disabled and the elderly. We know today that thanks to this historic, this landmark report, what the costs of these social protection floors are and what are the needs for extra financing. So what does this mean? What does this study mean? Two important things are determined in this study. First, the cost of the social protection floor in developing countries is 2.4% of the GDP per annum. This, of course, is just an average. Secondly, to finance this SPF, these countries should increase uh, their social protection expenditure of 1.6% of their GDP per annum. 1.6% of the GDP represents more than 500 billion per, per annum. 
uh, and these 527 billion to be quite exact. Now let's analyze these figures uh, and look at it more closely. In the 28 countries uh, with a low income, in the landmark study, the finance and needs is only 27 billion per annum. In others, it'll be less than 1 billion per country. And these are countries such as Burkina Faso, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Gambia, Madagascar, Nepal, Somalia, Ethiopia, Chad, Haiti, Niger, Senegal, Rwanda, Sierra Leone, etc., South Sudan, Zimbabwe, etc. In these countries with an intermediate revenue, uh, income, it's 500 billion per annum. The study demonstrates in this way that all the regions and all developing countries must invest more in social protection, and that includes in countries with an intermediate high-level countries. And of course, from what I've just said, I see the question just come up in your minds, and that is, can the countries cover these uh, financing requirements? Because I've talked about big figures. The answer varies from one country to another. According to the results of the study, on an average, these financing requirements represent 13.5% of the fiscal burden. Consequently, we respond <clears throat> that many developing countries have the capacity to cover their financing requirements through national financing sources, such as taxes and social uh, contributions. However, we consider countries with low income situations completely different. The need for financing in these 28 countries repre would represent the equivalent of 45% of their current uh, tax burden or fiscal burden. So to cover this financial requirement is for these countries a tremendous challenge. For these countries, we should set up massive financial assistance, which will enable them, first of all, to develop these uh, social protection floors. I'm talking about the uh, investments at the beginning. Of course, uh, that's uh, establishing policies, drawing up policies, uh, adopting laws, uh, training staff, opening offices, and developing the computer systems. Secondly, this financial assistance will enable us to cover a part of the, the recurrent financing requirements, that is the cost of, con of the benefits and the administrative uh, costs of these systems. Well, the level of development assistance as regards social protection is today modest, and I could even use the word ridiculous. It corresponds only to 0.0037% of the GDP of the donator of the countries. This might be a good piece of news because it means that the, the margin for making headway is tremendous, immense. Another interesting lesson to be learned from this report is that today the social insurance systems developing countries have progressing progression margins which are extraordinary. They could uh, increase coverage to important groups, the population and the informal economy, and generate 1.2 percent of the GDP, additional GDP, for the financing of the social protection. So what are the recommendations? We have three main recommendations. First of all, it is essential to increase the fiscal space for social protection. In other words, the capacity of each country to finance the extension of social protection. This could be accomplished through fiscal reforms in the countries. The international community should also take effective measures to fight against the illegal exodus of capital, the money laundering, and fiscal fraud. Secondly, we would like to make an uh, uh, appeal so that development aid increase as regards social protection and does not just focus on in investments at the beginning, but also on the recurrent investment of the systems, at least for the poorest countries, which Otherwise, they would never be able to achieve the SDGs on the social protection by 2030. Perhaps that a world uh, fist, uh, 
entity for the financing of social protection could be created. It would enable specifically to develop and channel innovative financial procedures on social protection. Thirdly, or thirdly, third message, we have to extend the contributive social protection which contributes to the work of the informal economy, which today is, they're often excluded from assistance for the workers of the private formal sector who are not entitled to receive social assistance. These workers are the ones who are left out of social protection. In English, we call them the missing middle. So we have to be imaginative and build systems which respond to their needs. And this will enable us to cover and to fill a great part of the gap of the 537 billion per annum that we need. So how about more solidarity? Yes, we're moving towards it. Social protection is, by definition, a mechanism of solidarity of redistribution. We do not have the same opportunities in life, and social protection was created to, to make systematic and reinforce a principle of assistance which exists in almost all the families and traditional societies. Today, 10% of the, rich the richest people earn 90 times more than the 10% of the poorest. The unequal uh, revenues are not just revolting, morally speaking. We know today that high inequalities slow down economic growth and make it less robust, less vigorous. We also know, and all we need to do is to look at uh, the news of what's happening in all the regions of the world, we know that faced with social inequalities, uh, discontent is swelling and might destabilize whole economies. So it is high time to fulfill the commitments which have been undertaken in the Addis Ababa Action Plan. It is time to really sh demonstrate solidarity. By way of conclusions, I would like to quote the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which says in Article 22, and I quote any person, as a member of society is entitled to social security. The same statement, Universal in, uh, Declaration says in Article 25, Every person is entitled to a sufficient lifestyle to be able to ensure his health, his well-being, and that of his family. Thank you very much. Mr. Amaru, thank you very much uh, for giving us uh, the key findings of the study and bringing to light a lot of clarity around the actual size of the financing gap. You've also framed uh, this as an opportunity for us to do much, much more, to move from 0 0.00037 to something that really could make the, a difference for all people around the world. You have landed on some key recommendations. We need to have some fiscal reforms if we're going to be able to create the fiscal space required. And in the conversation later this afternoon, we're going to be exploring exactly that idea. You have challenged us to think about how are we dispersing development aid um, and the extent to which this is sustained. And finally, you have challenged us not to turn away from the missing middle and really think about if we're reaching those in the informal sector that for a large part actually make up the vast majority of people in the workplace, especially in continents such as Africa where I come from. Thank you for the reminder of solidarity and redistribution that sits at the core of the conversations that we're having here today. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great privilege for me to invite our keynote speaker, a university professor and director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University. He's also a director at the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network and the commissioner of the UN Broadband Commission for Development. He's been an advisor to three UN Secretaries General and currently serves as an SDG advocate under Secretary General Antonio Guterres. He has spent over 20 years as a professor at Harvard University and has authored a number of bestseller books. 
He's been named twice amongst, amongst Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential World Leaders and was also ranked by The Economist as amongst the top three most influential living economists. It's my pleasure and my privilege to welcome onto the stage for our keynote, Mr. Jeffrey Sachs. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you very, very much, Nosy, for the nice introduction. And uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Director General, for the wonderful remarks just now. And to Valerie Schmidt and her team at ILO, and to ILO as an organization for its leadership for social protection and for social justice. Our world is really unfair. It's getting more unfair. And I want to spend a few minutes uh, on the numbers and what we can do about it. And uh, try to help provide some practicalities for how to move forward. The basic point is really simple. The world economy right now is about $100 trillion worldwide. Keep that in mind, a hundred trillion. So you can divide any number by a hundred trillion to estimate the share involved in global income. Social protection turns out to be a very small share. In other words, at a very small fraction of world income, we could ensure universal rights the rights that were promised in 1948. There's nothing hard to do about this except the greed of rich and powerful people. Please understand this. All the hand-wringing and all the difficulties we have when people can't stay alive, when children are underfed, when 260 million kids are not in school at school age. For a hundred trillion dollar world economy and 7.7 .7 billion people, that's an average of 12,000 per person. Every single child could be in school. Everybody could have health care. Everybody could have social protection. But the world's not like that. Why? Well, we have 2,000 people that are billionaires. Their net worth is $10 trillion today. This is obscene. Kids dying by the millions, and Zuckerberg and Bezos and others strutting their way and wanting to go to Mars and so forth as if they should determine the future. or my, I, maybe he's a pseudo-billionaire, but supposedly billionaire president. We don't really know until we see his tax returns, but he's a crook. And he wants to cut social, pr yeah, you heard it right in the translation. <laughs> he's a crook. Let's know it, ladies and gentlemen, we're adults. This is our one world we should speak honestly. We wring our hands over helping a kid get an 80 cent dose for malaria and we fail 400,000 times a year right now. And then the billionaires have $10 trillion of net worth. And then we're told there isn't the money to do things. And then Mr. Bezos tours the world making tax evasion. And we're in the world's capital of tax evasion. People come here to visit their money. So let's get real, please, before we blow up everything. Today, the story came, just to keep it in context, we're now on the path to reach 3.9 degrees Celsius warming by the end of this century. 
You want to see people on the streets, you want to see people dying of hunger, dislocation of hundreds of millions of people, we just have to keep on that way too. The greed is insufferable. So I wanted to go through a few numbers to illustrate what's really at stake. If we could go to the next slide. You can't really read the numbers necessarily, but I'll leave the presentation for people that are interested, and I'm sure that ILO can share it. Working together with the IMF, which has done a wonderful job in the Fiscal Affairs Department in the past two years, we've looked at the 59 countries that are the so-called low-income developing countries, LIDCs. It's the IMF's classification of low- and middle-income countries. There are 59 countries. They have right now 1.5 billion people in them. They're our focus because all the rest can pay their way. That's their internal problems, but the poorest countries can't pay their way unless we tax Bezos, unless we have some decency from my country, the United States, which spends 30 times more on war than it does on development assistance. So that's our focus. If you go to the next slide, here's the key. And here I do want to urge ILO not to have a kind of optical illusion. We have many objectives. Social protection is one of them. Children in school is another. Health care is another. Access to safe water and sanitation is another. Access to basic electricity services is another. Basic public administration is another. The way to understand this issue is to look at the overall fiscal needs. If you just focus on social protection, it is a small number and you would say that's easy. But governments need to provide schools, clinics, water, sanitation, as well as social protection. So we need to understand the fiscal envelope of poor countries and middle-income countries. Doing that isn't going to change the basic conclusion. It's all affordable, but not by these countries themselves. It requires global solidarity. God forbid rich countries should do something. Honestly. People don't know how little the rich countries do because rich countries write the storyline. People don't know that the U.S. gives 0.15 of 1% of GDP in development aid and spends 4% of GDP on the military. People don't know that. So I'm telling you, because you have to understand how we have poverty in a rich world. The answer is injustice, not necessity. Injustice. And we have the votes. It's a small number of elites that block the way, but they own the media. They own the politics. How does a guy like Trump get to be president? Ask yourself the question. It's not normal. It's money. It's interest. He delivered. He came in, delivered a trillion dollars of tax cuts for the richest people in the United States instead of social protection, instead of development aid. In fact, he's cut the development aid. So if you look at the whole budget, here is really the point I want you to understand. The poor countries cannot afford to meet the basic needs out of their own revenues. 
There is an inherent gap. If we just point to poor countries and say, what's wrong with you? We're not pointing to the rich people who could do something about it. We're pointing to the victims. We're not pointing to the true story. Point to Trump, Bezos, Gates, Buffett, Zuckerberg, Page, Brin. Point to them. Where are they? By the way, Bill Gates, who has done a decent job, he gives several billion dollars a year, but just to illustrate how the world works, he had $50 billion of net worth in 2010. He's given away about $4 billion a year since then. He now has $100 billion of net worth. That's after he became a full-time philanthropist. The money soars. And this year, the richest 500 Americans paid a lower tax rate than all the rest of Americans. Because it's a rigged system, ladies and gentlemen. It's a gimmick. It's a fraud. What you can show rigorously is if you add up health care and education and infrastructure needs, can, conservation of biodiversity, agriculture, social protection, justice, you come up with about 59% of the GDP of the poor countries. They don't have 59% of GDP in their budget, they have 20% in their budget. But the gap is tiny because the poor people are so poor that with a little bit of help from the rich countries, you close the financing gap. That's what we need to understand. I don't want to absolve poor countries of responsibility. They need to be honest. They need to have transparency in their processes. But let's stop pointing the finger at the poorest people in the world and accusing them or saying, we don't know what to do, or it's all so complicated. Why don't we do another randomized control trial? Come on. Rich people know very well what they need, more money. Poor people need health care, social protection, clean water, sanitation. It's not complicated. It's really not complicated. To understand what poor people need, look what rich people want and have. Then you get a good idea. Next slide, please. I hope I'm being clear. Next slide. If you look at the SDG needs, the biggest two categories are health and education, then infrastructure, then social protection. They're all important. I love what the ILO is doing on social protection. It's crucial. And the ideas of pensions, disability, maternal and child social protection are absolutely necessary. Put them into an overall fiscal program that also includes health care, education, basic infrastructure, Add up the costs, find the gap, and then go to Mr. Trump and to the Swiss government and to Bezos. And let's get this gap closed because that's all we're talking about. The costs of not closing this gap are shocking. Ladies and gentlemen, under our responsibility, because we're leaders in this room, five million kids will die this year under the age of five. Die. And we're just here, WHO is just up the road. WHO could tell you those deaths are all preventable because they're from a, a childbirth where there's not a 15 sent plastic squeegee to clear the airways of the newborn. 
because the vaccines aren't given, because there's not an 80 cent dose of malaria medicine. These are completely preventable causes. Why isn't this the biggest emergency on the planet? Why isn't it? It's a mystery to me, frankly, why it isn't. Because we're not raising our voices properly. Or the 260 million kids not going to school. Because there's no classroom for them. There's no teacher for them. There's no toilet for them. There's no electricity for them. There's no floor, there's dirt floor. There's no material supplies. I know I have visited these countries for 25 years. I've looked at their budgets. We're not doing our jobs, ladies and gentlemen, because our bosses in the governments are not doing their jobs. And in my country, it's because they're all on the take. Eight billion dollars a year per election cycle coming from the richest people in the United States. It's called democracy. It's democracy for the corporate class. Next, please. So, we have to calculate what do you need, what can countries mobilize on their own because they can mobilize more domestic resources, maybe five percentage points of GDP than the, more than they're collecting. In some cases, maybe eight to 10 percent of GDP more over the coming decade. But that leaves a huge gap. Of course, countries should spend their own money properly. They should raise their own money properly. But there still is a gap. And let's point to the richest people and say to Trump, no, you don't get a free pass. The United States doesn't get a free pass in this world. There is no America first. This is a world deal. Not any one country claiming a prerogative when we have 193 countries in this world and the United States is 4.4% of the world population. It's not 95% of the world population, it's just 4%. So it has 6,000 nuclear warheads. It doesn't mean that it can determine the future of the planet or absent itself from responsibility or pull out of the Paris Climate Agreement and let the climate go to hell. There's no right for that. Next, please. Next, please. OK. There is a gap. The gap that the IMF calculated very professionally, much calmer than I do, believe me, is the same gap that my team calculated. 300 to 500 billion dollars a year for the low income developing countries. Keep that in mind. 300 to 500 billion a year for the 59 low income developing countries. Is that a big number? This is my quiz question to you as professor. Is 500 billion a big number? Now that you have heard a good lecture, you immediately answer no, Professor Sachs. Because the world income is 100 trillion. So we're not fooled. That's just 0.5 of 1% of world output. We're not fooled, Professor Sachs, because half of world output is the rich countries. So it's just 1% of the income of the rich countries to close the entire financing gap of the 59 low and lower middle income countries. 1% for health, education, social protection, infrastructure, biodiversity conservation. So don't be fooled by numbers. I'm giving you a macroeconomic tip today. Macroeconomists only know how to make long division. Okay? Remember 100 trillion. So whenever you're given a number, divide by 100 trillion. And then you'll know it's small. 
Or if you want another divisor, I'll give you a couple more divisors. Another divisor is 50 trillion for the rich countries or 20 trillion just for the United States. Can you imagine? Or 10 trillion of net worth for the 2,000 billionaires. So use those as crib notes. Whenever you're presented with a number, where are we going to find $5 billion to control malaria? Your answer is, are you kidding? Don't you know that $50 trillion of output per year in the rich countries? Don't you know that 2,000 people have $10 trillion? That's your answer. And let me give you another hint. If the rich people pay 1% wealth net worth, what's that? Quick quiz question. If their net worth is $10 trillion, what's 1% of that? $100 billion. 2,000 people, $100 billion. And I'll tell you another hint of a study that I did. I worked hard. I determined you can get by with just $1 billion in your bank account. So you should understand that the 2,000 billionaires, even if we left them each with $1 billion, we'd collect $8 trillion above the $1 billion. And it's really true. You can get by with just $1 billion. You should try it. So these numbers are small. They're not large. We're wringing our hands for no reason. Don't wring your hands. Point your finger. If you want, I'll send you the list of the top billionaires, but you can look it up every day at Bloomberg.com. You'll get their daily net worth. I'm a voyeur, so I look at it. Because I want them to pay something. I want them to stop getting the tax breaks. I want the children to survive. I want them to be in school. I want the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to be observed 72 years after it was promulgated, for heaven's sake. This is our choice, ladies and gentlemen. We just have to disambiguate. We have to clear the smoke screen. We have to explain where the money really is and why this is so affordable. Next, please. So, in 1971, the rich countries promised to give 0.7 of 1% of their national income as official development aid. Where are we today? At 0.3 of 1%, not at 0.7. That's 0.4 of 1% shortfall. So, quiz question, how big is the shortfall? Well, you'll immediately remember, Professor Sachs said, the rich countries have a $50 trillion income. So 1% of that is $500 billion. A 0.4 of 1% shortfall is $200 billion a year. So our development aid is $200 billion a year short of what it should be. Who is responsible for that shortfall? My country the United States, which is running for the medal of the most selfish country in the world. Because our development aid is now 0.16 of 1% of GDP. We're a half a percent of GDP lower than we should be. How big is that? Quiz question. I already gave you the number. We're a $20 trillion economy. So if you're half of 1% short, you're $100 billion a year short. Where is that going? It's going into Trump's pocket. 
and it's also going to our 700 military bases around the world. Some deal, and the kids are dying instead. Next, please. So these calculations come up with the financing gap. And they show how utterly financeable it is with a little bit of international solidarity. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So the financing gap to fund all of the SDGs, as I told you, is a half of 1% of world GDP or 0.9 of 1% of the advanced economies. And it would decline over time because countries are developing. And so on average, over the next decade, it's 0.4 of 1% of world output, 0.7 of 1% of the GDP of the advanced countries. Don't let anyone tell you this is not affordable or that it's only the responsibility of the poor people in this world. That's the rigged answer. That's the Fox News answer. That's the Rupert Murdoch media answer. That's the Donald Trump tweet answer. That's not reality. Reality is we could solve this problem basically today with a little bit of honesty and decency. Next, please. So I just want to mention some of the financing options because we need to get practical now. First, global tax reform. We have to end the tax havens. Not the places, but the havens. Switzerland, Luxembourg, London, the United States, the Caribbean, these are tax havens. They are places to hide money. They're places to shift corporate income. The corporate income all ends up here or in a similar tax haven not paying tax, using transfer pricing. It's well known. The OECD has been discussing this for 10 years. But of course, nothing happens because it's the rich and the powerful that are deciding. It's estimated that with some tax reform, at least $50 billion more, at least, could be devoted in the low income developing countries. Of course, it's hundreds of billions that would be collected, but most of it would go to the higher income countries. Then we need wealth taxation. We need to tax the billionaires. We need to tax the ultra high net worth. But that has to be done globally so that the billionaire doesn't just make his legal residence in the next tax haven because countries sell their citizenships so that people can declare non-residency. We need increased development aid. We need, when Bill Gates has called on billionaires to give more, they've signed up but they haven't given. That's the giving pledge. A trillion dollars has been promised roughly, or a trillion dollars of wealth of the people that have signed. Half a trillion has been promised but we don't see any evidence for it. So that should be honored as well. Next, please. Uh, next. Nope, they're going backwards. The other way. The other way. The other way. Yes. Uh, no? OK. That's probably all I really have to say. And so let me review before the hour exam. $100 trillion world output. 50 trillion in the high income countries. 0.7 of 1%, 350 billion promised in development aid. 150 billion actually delivered. 200 billion gap. 
100 billion of that due to the United States, which overwhelmingly spends its money on the military, more than the next 10 countries combined. The richest people, $10 trillion. My point is the ILO is completely on the right track. It's done heroic work in pointing out the social value and the commitment to social protection. It has shown a small amount that's needed, and I hope that I've helped to show where we're going to find it. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, if, if ever there was a presentation that was rooted in radical truthfulness, we spoke about this yesterday, courageous, frank, to the point, not wringing of the hands, but pointing to the solutions. And if I may quote just one line, there's nothing hard about this, let's just do it. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure now to invite onto the stage our panelists that are going to be taking what we've heard from Mr. Amuru as well as what we've heard from Professor Sachs, bringing it together and contextualizing this within their own context. So I'm going to ask Mr. Amuru to come back to join us on stage as well. And I'm also going to ask the Minister of Labor and Social Security from Cameroon uh, Minister Owono to please come and join us. Welcome, sir. Let's give him a round of applause. I'm going to call upon uh, Professor, um, prof uh, Madam Jayati Ghosh, who is a professor at Jawaharlal Nehru University. Madam Professor Ghosh, thank you very much for being here. Let's give her a round of applause. And we also have the Secretary General of the National Union of Workers and Domestic Workers from Mexico, Madame Marcelina Bautista, with us today. Madame, please join us. Thank you very much. Minister Owono, allow me just to come to you immediately. Um, we know that Cameroon has been a very interesting case study in the sense that it's engaged in a process of modernizing and extending its social protection system. Um, and perhaps two highlights worth sharing are the extension of social security to workers in the informal economy, as well as the development of a universal health coverage system. Two quick questions. Could you share with us the cost per capita per year of these two schemes? And secondly, what is the strategy to finance these two schemes? Thank you for giving me the floor. And I'd like to thank the ILO for having allowed me to come onto this panel. It's rather difficult to take the floor after such a brilliant speech by Mr. Sachs. And also the Deputy Director General of the ILO. But I'll simply tell you a bit about what Cameroon is doing. We have, or rather we are in the process of introducing universal health coverage, which occupies a very important part, place in our policy. But we already have up and running voluntary insurance. More than 10% of our economy is an informal economy. So the social protection system has been set up only for those working in structures such as the administration or 
the formal sector, but as the uh, as as most of the economy is the is informal. Most people do not have any real social protection, so we've tried to set up, and this for four years now, what we've called voluntary insurance. So everybody knows more or less what they earn, they declare their income, and then examine with the social protection bodies how much they can contribute per month or per quarter or per half year or per year and for how many years it f and and how, how many years they can retire and what are the risks so today there are about 200,000 people who have joined this scheme This is in the context of a mixed economy, and it's working well. And uh, the, the results are fairly satisfactory. Now, the cost of public health today in Cameroon is fairly high. It's about 5% of the gross national income. It's about 67 US dollars per capita. I think we'll be able to shoulder, uh, we'll be able to increase that to $90 per capita in a few years' time. So that's briefly what we're doing in Cameroon. How all this, is all this going to be financed? I talked about the, the voluntary in health insurance that is funded by individuals themselves and by structures that so far have been informal. But the new sources of funding are going to be set up, starting, of course, with the state, and then by structures and by individuals. What we should note is that apart from that, there is part of the population made up of very poor people, the people who can't pay their way and we have to examine what the state can do for them. So, very briefly, in view of the time I have, that's what I can tell you about our experience in Cameroon. And we associate ourselves very, very closely to these experiences in social protection, because a lot is at stake. And it is absolutely essential to achieve this in Cameroon. Minister, uh, for, for sharing with us uh, a very practical example of what is happening in Cameroon. And of course, you have, you've ended on the point of uh, the strategy for financing for the very poor. And I'd love to build on that by coming to Madame Bautista. Because, Madame, we know that you've been an activist uh, for the rights of domestic workers for many years, and we've begun to really see the success of the work that you have been doing. The question to you is, how can increased investments in social protection accelerate the protection of domestic workers, in your view? Well, I think that it's important not just to think about an investment for workers, domestic workers, but to think about an investment for all the workers and their families. In Mexico, the social protection, as we call it social security, that is something that we have enshrined in our constitution in the first article and 123, as well as also appears in the Universal Declarations of Human Rights endorsed by Mexico, ratified by Mexico. It's also important that the homework, domestic work, is one of the most uh, jobs which is, uh, has received the least consideration and doesn't have this coverage for the people who work in it. Today, domestic work is recognized as work, which is formal, 
part of the pharma sector. Therefore, the employers have the obligation to comply with their rights uh, for the people who are working. Also, the state has the responsibility of administering, managing the issue of health, lodgings, housings, maternity, as well as a retirement fund. Social protection for the people who are working in domestic in homework, domestic work. And it's also important to think that the idea that all these rights can be achieved, beginning by the government, it's very important to talk about communication in that case and the civil organizations. Both CASIC, which is the organizations of domestic workers, I'd like their trade union, and other alliances which we have achieved. With uh, movie producers, we are carrying out important campaigns so that this reached the greatest number of domestic workers. And of course, we are also carrying out awareness raising campaigns so that mainly the employers be the ones who comply with the rights of their workers. I'd also like to say that when we're talking about the fact that the people throughout the world do not have coverage for social protection, then we're talking about the fact that many governments do not comply with a public, an effective public policy, which guarantees that the people become aware, empower themselves, and can demand these rights that they have. Although it's true in Mexico, coverage for social security, we are achieving it, but much is left to be done. We have a pilot plan in which we are not allowing the fact that most of the domestic workers can be covered. Therefore, we think that our government is going to have to make it compulsory so that home workers, domestic workers can achieve these rights. Thank you very much. And so what I think what you've done for us is also begun to shine the light that as we sit and not wring our hands, we also need to hold our governments accountable and to ensure that that which the government has promised to the people is delivered. Um, so thank you very much for lifting the pilot plan in Mexico as one of the many examples. Professor Gosh, let me come to you because I know there's a recent article uh, that you have penned which is titled um, The Exploitation Time Bomb. And what this speaks to is the income inequality that I think uh, Professor Sachs has also touched on, qui on quite a bit. Um, and it shows that income disparities have widened uh, since reducing in inequality became an official goal of the international community, which is an interesting conundrum. And in fact, when we think about SDG 10, which calls on countries to reduce inequality within and amongst countries, as well as SDG 10.4, which calls on countries to adopt policies, and fis um, especially fiscal wage and social protection policies, to move towards greater equality. The question to you is, how can social protection policies contribute to reducing income inequality? Well, thank you very much. I, it's working. Yes, it just I, takes two I, to I three first, seconds. Yeah, I just really want to thank Jeff Sachs for telling it like it is. Yes. I think uh, the answer to your question was already there in his speech. We all know in this room how social protection can contribute to reducing inequalities. But I think what he brought out very clearly is that we cannot separate this from the fiscal issues. We cannot separate this from taxation, from global policies that enable both tax evasion and tax avoidance, and from fiscal strategies that do not enable rich countries to do what they have promised to do in terms of development aid. So I think that, that lesson is actually really what is crucially important. And in this context, I just want to highlight two issues which he touched on, but maybe we need to just dwell on a bit more since he's now got us into the mood of <laughs> telling the truth and uh, not being terribly frightened about being polite. I think it's important to remember that if you want to meet the SDG goals, the current strategy of the UN is not going to cut it. Okay, it's not going to meet any of the goals. Forget one, two, three, four, it doesn't matter. It's not going to meet any of the goals because it is not demanding a significant change in fiscal strategy, either nationally or internationally. It's not demanding genuine tax cooperation 
which will prevent not just tax evasion into tax havens, as he mentioned, but will allow all countries to actually tax multinationals properly. At the moment, they avoid taxes by doing this profit shifting, base erosion stuff. We have to have a unitary system of taxing multinationals. It's very easy to do. The US does it already within its own states. Mm -hmm. It is low-hanging fruit available for the international community. But we are being led up a garden path by the OECD, which is essentially doing some kind of little trickery, saying, oh, we'll only tax residual profits, not routine profits, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, we will tax multinationals the same way we tax companies within the country. Yeah. We need a global deal to do that. And those who talk about social protection, therefore, have to talk about taxes. Jeff also mentioned wealth taxes. And it's absolutely true. You can tax you know, just the top richest 2,000 people. But you don't even have to look only at the US. Uh, in India, I mean, so much of what he was saying resonated, because I think all of us have, many of us, have pretty awful governments and lots of rich, a few very, very rich people. If we just taxed our plutocrats, who are also in the global wealthy list, 1% of GDP, we could generate enough to give universal pensions to all our people mm -hmm. at half the minimum wage. Yeah. Now, basically what, what, this is, what Jeff's uh, talk I think really brought home and which I would just like to repeat and reiterate is that all of us who believe in universal social protection and in a reasonable level of social protection, not a pathetic little pension yeah. that doesn't mean anything, not a pathetic child grant that doesn't contribute at all, but genuine proper social protection as in the floor that was envisaged. Yeah. We have to talk about raising those revenues. It can be done. It just needs a much broader political mobilization because governments have to be forced to have that political mm. will. Mm. So I, in the spirit of what he began with this morning, I would request... Uh, this group, which is full, I know, of uh, the most wonderful people who are really motivated and active in, in working about this, is to just take this seriously. Don't leave the macro part to a bunch of so-called technocrats who are not going to recognize that this is all about inequality and injustice and demand a much broader social movement mm. that actually says there is the money available. We can do it. We mm. can set in place national and international systems. We just have to have the political will. So, ladies and gentlemen, tr truth is contagious. Truth is contagious, and it spreads very quickly. I, and w I had planned to come back to you, Professor Gosch, a little bit later, but I think that I have a very quick follow-up question that relates to what you've just said. Because, again, I want to go back to this article that you've penned. And if I go to the final sentence, I quote, this is what you've written. You say, if policy makers fail to mount a response that is proportionate to the problem, the rich will continue to get richer and the poor will get poorer faster than ever. Who will address the problem then? And so the question, and I end of quote. And so the question I quickly want to bring to you as a follow-up quote as you talk about this global deal, what might a proportionate response look like, very briefly? Well, you know, there are several elements to this, uh, to this global deal. And again, I think Jeff, in, in this brilliant presentation, outlined them very well. But uh, it's not just about the taxation. It's also about changing the global rules in ways that enable countries to actually do their independent policies, to have the policy autonomy, to avoid unnecessary fiscal austerities when it's not required, to avoid having to pay sovereign debts that were not taken on by that generation mm -hmm. but have been multiplying over time because we don't have proper sovereign debt resolution mechanisms, to actually get away from a system of intellectual property rights and control mm -hmm. that basically transfers rents to multinationals and does not allow developing countries the technologies that they need to do the things effectively. So there's a whole range of things that would be part of this global deal, yeah. none of which is really, as he said, that difficult. None of, none of them is that difficult. But once again, I want to come back to this thing that what do we get today from much of the UN system? We get uh, the argument that we can finance the SDGs through innovative financing yeah. mechanisms that bring in public-private partnerships that enable 
new financial instruments that will somehow mitigate the risk for private players so we can have bond financed SDGs. This is what is being offered to us. And uh, if I may be forgiven for getting very overly influenced by the frankness of this morning, it's a load of crap. We really, have to, <laughs> <laughs> we really have to get away from being taken up a garden path on this. Yeah. Prof, thank you very much. I literally have just six minutes uh, left for this. I look forward to seeing the uh, transcript uh, of this conversation uh, where we've had some very colorful language uh, that's been used. And I love it. I encourage it. I've got six minutes left. And before I begin to wrap, I'm going to ask uh, 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 Professor Sachs to reflect. I'm going to ask Mr. Omaru to reflect. But before I do, Minister, let me just quickly come to you. Um, if we, if we just think about um, the conversation uh, that we've just had, could you just briefly share with us the, the, the plans uh, that Cameroon has in play to address the financing gaps that you're, you had uh, outlined for us at the beginning of your, uh, of your contribution? I can talk about what's being envisaged at this point in time. The problem of financing is a, an overall global problem. It's a world, it has received world recognition. Mr. Sachs has talked about certain solutions, but truly, the rich have to be able to change their position and the, the position where they always become all the richer all the time and they're becoming richer more and more. And then if they don't do that, then we cannot cover the poorest. But beyond these concepts, Cameroon is thinking about legislation which could allow for putting together the maximum more and creating a very attractive framework that is financially speaking. And then it's a good idea that international agreements at the social protection level can be complied with, respected. And at that point in time, then we will come up with a conventional financing and, and, and individuals can give what they or give what they can give, because what I haven't told you is that the situation is rather alarming, because 6% of the population benefits from a social protection system. So it's urgent for us to find solutions, to find this funding. And this financing can not just be created locally. And this is why these solutions, which are envisaged at a worldwide level, global level, are solutions to be envisaged absolutely categorically towards which Cameroon as well is also going to endorse. Your, Your Excellency, and again, again, surfacing some really, really big numbers for us to wrap our heads around. Professor Sachs, uh, you've heard uh, some of the ideas around what is being done, what could be done, what is planned on being done. We've seen your, uh, your radical truthfulness uh, taking off on the panel as well and rubbing off into the conversation. Quick reflections from you. What do we do from here on? What is going to be required to, for us to achieve and to finance uh, the, the SDGs on social protection? Great. Thank you, uh, and thanks, uh, wonderful, uh, distinguished uh, panel members. Let me do one more uh, little bit of arithmetic uh, for us. Uh, the minister mentioned uh, $90 per capita, but I'm going to round it to 100 so that it's easy for us to do the division. So rich people, 10 trillion, 1% wealth tax, 100 billion, per capita cost $100. That's 1 billion people with social protection from 2,000 billionaires who would never notice the difference. Okay? 1 billion people. All of Cameroon's needs met like that. But not just Cameroon. A billion people, ladies and gentlemen, for two thousand people that cannot manage a human being cannot spend a billion dollars on themselves by the way 
try it. You can't even buy enough yachts. So this is the basic point. This is not hard. Second, we're going to get you the money, Minister. What I would like you to do is send me a letter, explain $90 per capita. These are the number of people. This is our fiscal gap. I'm going to take it to the managing director of the International Monetary Fund and the Secretary General and the President of the General Assembly. We're going to get you the money, okay? And I invite others to send the letter, too, because we're going to close this gap. We're going to build on the wonderful work of the ILO, which has been so important, yeah. and bringing all of this to our attention in ways that it would never have come to our attention but for the steadfastness of this institution. We're going to get this money funded. Then I want to uh, follow up on uh, what uh, Professor Ghosh said. Uh, absolutely fantastic. First, on the tax side, we're in a race to the bottom. And I mean bottom, ladies and gentlemen. Think Trump, bottom, okay? It's just unbelievable. One country after another, oh, we have to cut our corporate taxes so that we can get the money, get the capital investment instead of the other one, but all it's a game. It's like Mr. Bezos went around our country in the United States telling every city, we won't pay taxes to you, how much will you give us, Amazon, to the richest person in the world? And you know, the cities bid to get him to put the so-called HQ2, Headquarters 2, in their city. They paid, not paying taxes. Mm. This is really destructive. That is the race to the very bottom. The OECD has not solved this problem at all. Because look who's on their board. The countries that are racing to the bottom, led by my country. Then the idea that private capital is the solution. Do you want to turn your health care system to private capital? I can explain a few things to you if you do, because we in the United States are really twisted political system, very corrupt, has done that. So we pay twice as much per capita, yeah. and we can't even afford to cover the country, even though it's the richest large country in the world, because we're paying twice the amount to the private. That's where we're going to turn your, your education system to the private capital? Come on. So this is exactly what you've said, that either they don't, the diplomats don't know the financial arithmetic and they're mesmerized by this private market, or they're scared of the member states or something. But the truth is, we got to get money out of taxing people and taxing companies, and then using it to pay for basic needs of people. Yeah. That's the deal. So this is exactly right. Final point I want to make is I believe we should quickly move to a UN General Assembly resolution on this, making it clear that it is the will of the vast majority of countries in the world to raise taxes on the corporate sector and the richest people in the world to fund the Sustainable Development Goals. And I'm appealing to Professor Ghosh to work with me on that. Her voice will be very mm. powerful. And we'll go to the General Assembly because we don't have governments on our board exactly, which is good. Yeah. And we'll make the case. But you have to help us, all the ministers and uh, others, to say, yes, this is the basic way forward. And if we can get this done, we can get the ILO's financing mechanism for social protection in place using these new revenues. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sachs. Thank you. I am officially standing between everyone and the tea break, so I want to take a final comment from Mr. Omaru. Um, we've had a fantastic response to the debate, to the presentation, the findings, uh, the keynote address. Very quickly, if you could land on three things that you say are going to be critical for the journey ahead in terms of, achieve, of achieving SDG 1.3, what would those three things be? 
um, I must say that if today we must see how to finance the deficit for the 1.3 SDG regarding social protection, and that's what we heard in this room, if there are three things to say, one, in uh, certain countries, countries where there's no social coverage and countries which don't make a contribution to financing, it's uh, not just the national economies which can be taken into account in extending the fiscal space and also for the extension of social protection and particularly regarding the informal economy. And I think that the minister did right to point this out here and also the other people taking the floor. The other thing that's come out of what we've said here and what is absolutely essential is the issue of national solidarity. National solidarity which enables us to set up systems, uh, social protection schemes, which enable us to extend the coverage for, uh, for universal coverage, enable us to distribute fairly, equitably, in a bearable manner, social protection, the cost of social protection at the, at the different uh, parts of the population, sectors of population. But what we can see here, what's important is international solidarity, 1.3 goal, as we saw with the figures that I quoted this morning, but also with what Professor Sachs has just said and everyone's familiar with, this goal can not just be reached with a national effort. A national effort is necessary. It's, it's something we cannot do without. But to have policies and national strategies, to have a tax system which enables us at a national level to seek a universal coverage, that is, the one, that is one thing. But this will not be enough. As we saw in the least developed countries, or the lower middle income countries, there necessarily we have to be able to help those countries in their financing and so that they can find a social protection schemes. So first of all, let's look nationally what the sectors are or the segments of the economy that should be covered by social protection, which contribute to social protection. And secondly, see how we can extend the fiscal space to others, sectors of the population. And thirdly, international solidarity. And finally, I would like to say as a, an ILO official here, the ILO has an approach which we call systemic approach, which is not in favor of a kind of uh, scheme or system in particular. It's a blending of the different systems so that all the populations can benefit from social protection and so that this social protection and its cost can be borne fairly, equitably. And finally, I would like to say the most important issue today is no longer awareness raising for social protection issues at stake here. That's already acquired. What's important is going beyond beyond uh, establishing policies and strategies, is to act, become active, and sometimes be resourceful so that we can then see how we can finance sustainably social protection in different countries. Uh, uh, Mr. Amaru, for your contribution, and just to bring us back on the point of solidarity. Ladies and gentlemen, as we close this conversation, I think it's important for us to land on the key themes. Most importantly, this is not hard do the numbers. I think that's probably the biggest takeaway. There's some arithmetic that needs to be done and we need to do the numbers. We need to remember this is all about solidarity and redistribution and it's about national and global solidarity. I think what's come through in this conversation is that if we dare to have the courage to be truthful, then the conversation changes fundamentally and we begin to look to different places to find the solutions. We cannot have this conversation without having a conversation about tax reform. These two conversations have to go hand in hand. And of course, it all comes down to will and the choices that we choose to take and the choices we choose not uh, to, to make. Ladies and gentlemen, 
This is the end of this particular conversation. Can I please ask for a big round of applause for my panelists? Thank you very much. As we, as we prepare to take a tea break, I'm going to appeal to you, please, uh, to uh, please be back in the room at 10.45 uh, uh, sharp. Please grab a quick coffee. Uh, don't forget, exhibitions are downstairs, digital maps if you'd like to, and let's keep the conversation going on social media. I'll see you at 10.45. Thank you. <laughs>